So thank you for all quieting down. Welcome. Uh, with no further ado, I'm thrilled to say that our president is here to help us kick off the event. So President Der Harrison, come on down. Why, thank you, Dion. It's Diane <laughs> Harrison. Thank you. No, teasing. I am so excited uh, to be here this afternoon and to see the room filled with so many faculty and staff. And I assume there are some students here too, but um, today what you're gonna be seeing are a few examples of what is a larger e-learning trend here at CSUN. And that is faculty who are embracing technology and incorporating it seamlessly, we hope, into their pedagogy to help our students succeed in a number of ways. I think your presence demonstrates your commitment to faculty development, professional growth, <coughs> learning new ways of doing things so that you might improve your teaching skills or improve and integrate your use of technology in the classroom and hopefully toward the goal overall of enhancing and improving our students' learning. I want to thank you for your support of our students and the university in these efforts. It's also an opportunity for you to meet and interact with fellow faculty, to listen, learn some tips, hopefully ex exchange some tips with each other, and take this opportunity to have the discussion be beneficial to each of you. The presentations that you will hear today were selected for projects that are both exemplary and inspirational and who represent the diverse range of e-learning projects and strategies that are underway at the university, both in terms of the technology tools that were used as well as the various departments and colleges that are involved. So to those of you who are presenting today, I want to thank you. Thank you for your willingness to share your work with your colleagues so that they may learn from you, so that we may all learn from you. And I understand that some of you are still perfecting your <laughs> skills and um, tool use. And I believe that's perfectly understandable. And I think our provost, Harry Hellenbrand, said that curriculum, and I would add classroom teaching, is a process. It's not a static end. You don't come to one point and leave it there for the next 30 years. So again, congratulations to those of you who are presenting. Thank you for doing so, and uh, we look forward to it. As you know, student success is our number one priority. And I think that it's very clear to the provost, to myself, to Vice President Hillary Baker, that the best way to ensure student success is to make sure that our faculty have the tools and the wherewithal to provide the best possible educational opportunities and experiences for our students. It's also clear that technology can be a powerful enabler to enhance the learning experience, but it is just a tool. And that tool has to be learned and implemented by the teacher, by the faculty, by the master person in the classroom who's actually delivering and using these tools. The job of the folks in our Faculty Technology Center is to help faculty incorporate technology into all aspects of learning. So again, my thanks to Hillary, to Dion, and their staff for working with academic affairs and our faculty to advance our university's academic mission. The Faculty Technology Center has prepared a video that will provide all kinds of information and data to show the extent to which this work is in fact 
being implemented at CSUN. And so with that, I'm pleased to turn the program back to Dion and who will start our video. questions while we're going through that flow so we would like you to hold your questions till the end and actually you don't have to hold them to the end we would like you to use a uh, digital resource to uh, ask those questions on polleverywhere.com so if you have a device in your hand if you have a phone if you have a tablet if you have your computer you can go to pollev.com backslash csun poll and submit your questions there anytime. Sometimes people call this a back channel. I'm not even sure if that's true, but I, I can only focus on one thing at a time, so this is gonna be hard for me. But uh, if, you, if you upload your questions there, we'll have time at the end for, for going through that. How many people have used Poll Everywhere? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, so that's not enough. So let's have a little practice right now. Everybody take out their device, okay? and go to polleverywhere.com and answer this question. Have you ever used polleverywhere.com? This is something you can use in your classroom, right? And get immediate feedback so you know whether students are answering your questions correctly or not. Okay? I've just taught cellular respiration. I did a poll everywhere. They didn't know anything. I needed to go over it again. It's really clear, okay? How many people just use a show of hands in their classroom? Okay, that's the old school way, all right? It still works, all right? It's not like that doesn't work. You can save these and download these and you can have multiple choice answers and you can use this to your benefit in your classroom. Okay, so for those of you who have not used it, clearly you're learning. There you go. So you're gonna ask your questions there. Is that good? So let's get started. We're gonna start out 
uh, with our first speaker is from biology, near and dear to my heart, Cheryl Van Buskirk, and she's going to tell us about engaging large classrooms. There you go, Cheryl. Thanks, Mary Pat, and thanks to the organizers for letting me speak to you today. Uh, my name is Cheryl, and as Mary Pat said, I'm in biology, and I teach upper division genetics courses as well as our large non-majors biology class, Bio 100. So this is a class that is very large enrollment, and my class alone has over 200 students in it. Um, and so uh, here's a picture of the um, auditorium, Curland Auditorium in the VPAC, um, and this is from the lectern here. And you can see how it might be hard for me to know if I'm actually connecting with a lot of my students. Um, and so what I'd like to talk to you about um, today is um, how, in addition to just acting like a, a dork, um, how technology can actually help me connect with my students and provide them with the information that they need to, to do well in this class. So from previous semesters, from polling my students, I know that one uh, problem was that they weren't all buying the textbook. It cost over $100. Um, and uh, since I was posting my slides anyway, they just relied on this. However, posted slides are just a fraction of what you really want them to know. And so in order to give them a resource, um, what I wanted to do was write them an iBook. And so I was very happy that the eText initiative last year um, let me do this uh, with style. So um, the advantage is it's, it's, it's in my voice. They know that if I wrote it, that it's something I want them to, to have. Um, it's free, and there's over 300 students using it now, so that's over $30,000 saved for our, our students, which really makes me happy. Um, this is not a My CSUN tablet course, so I can't uh, demand that they use iBooks. And so what I do is I just take each chapter and I make a PDF that has active links to um, videos and articles and all sorts of good things. And what I've done is I've just posted it on our course website. Now, this could have been a Moodle site. You could just post PDFs to Moodle and it'd be perfect. I happened to have a Google site that I like to use for Bio 100. And so they can just go along and they can touch these tabs up there. And they can scroll to the bottom and they can access every single chapter. Um, and it's in a very similar form to what they would see if they were actually using the iBook. So uh, what I want to do is just show you a sample chapter from this book. This was. Um, uh, uh, illustrated by my student, Jesse Lopez, who I could hire because of the eText initiative, and I got some excellent editing from uh, Dan Odom in our department. Uh, this is the chapter that we're on right now, uh, Cell Division in Cancer. Um, and uh, the text isn't anything special. Uh, what really makes it special is the illustrations. So um, some of it is public domain images, but for the most part, it's illustrations made um, by my student that are exactly what I wanted them to be. And she worked really hard on these. And I think that's what really makes this special. Um, there's lots of links to YouTube videos, some of which were already available and some of which I made on my own. And there's lots of questions embedded for them to answer. Um, and so here's one example. Oh, hello. <laughs> Here's one example of a two, uh, sort of a video that I made for these guys. It's the, a cell division song in animation. We need some cell division so that we can grow and heal. And as long as cells know when to stop, then it's no big deal. Proto-oncogenes, they help cells to replicate. And they could get jammed on if they were to mutate. Now cell division is subject to a high degree of scrutiny In every tissue, every day we stop attempted mutiny How do we accomplish this? Listen to your professor Genes that stop cell division are called tumor suppressors And it goes on <laughs> it, It's probably the cheeriest song about cancer you've ever heard <laughs> But it's good to have a catchy tune, because then you'll remember the material. Okay. <laughs> um, so like I said, it's not an iPad class, but I, I have taught from my iPad since I started here at CSUN. And so I like to use apps just as I'm at the front um, to help illustrate some concepts. So there's a lot of good apps that actually address basic biology issues. And so one of these <laughs> is GeneScreen, which I like to use to teach them the basics of genetics. And so after I've taught them what a, what a carrier is versus a recessive homozygote, I can uh, show them exactly what types of genetic outcomes you would get from 
certain types of matings. And I think this is a, a really good way to illustrate this. It's nicer than just writing this out and telling them 25% is going to be sick. They can see it happening right before their eyes. And so there's a lot of other good apps, um, too. We can use ones that help us set up neural circuits. We can uh, spin molecules around in front of them. So it's, it's been really, really useful. Um, so uh, back to the... <laughs> Uh, the, the question of how to make sure that I'm actually engaging them in class is something um, that I'm able to address using a clicker system. So you could use um, anything. You could use Poll Everywhere. You could use Socrative. Um, most of these are limited to maybe 50 students a class, and then you have to start paying. So I'm using Top Hat. It's a really good system. Um, it's $20 a semester, but it's the only thing that they have to pay for in this class. And the nice thing is that it's, it's completely device neutral. They can use a tablet, they can use a smartphone, they can even text using an old-fashioned phone, and so everybody can participate. Um, and 15% of their grade, so it keeps them coming, but it's flexible enough that they can miss a class and not feel too panicked about it. Um, at the beginning of the semester, there, there's always a few technical issues, and they're a little bit unsure, but by the mid-semester, they are just screaming out for more top hat questions because they really, really enjoy it. And I was actually really surprised at how much it changes the dynamic of the class. It really breaks it up and, and makes it a lot more fun. So, so I'm very pro top hat. Um, there's still some challenges. Um, I'm still using Scantrons and I'm still photocopying a lot of exams. I'd really like to be able to give them exams on Moodle. Um, but since it's not a, a tablet class, um, I, would, I would have to have some sort of device neutral um, section of the class where they're required to bring something um, where they could then access the Moodle exams. Another option is to actually allow them to take um, exams at home on their own time. So that, that brings up a few of its own issues, but I think that that would be a really exciting option because um, then of course it would free up more class time for, for actual teaching. Um, the last thing I want to mention is um, some of the challenges that I'm having in my upper division genetics class. Um, this is a CSUN tablet class, and so we get to have our exams um, in class on Moodle, which has been really, really nice. Um, one of the drawbacks is there aren't a lot of really good apps for these more high-level issues in biology for, for complex um, concepts. Um, another issue is the one that we all face, which is there's never really enough class time for both lecture and problem solving. Um, and of course, one way to deal with this is to, to flip your class um, and do the lectures via videos. Um, I do it a slightly different way, and I do a lot of problem solving using videos um, online. And so these are much shorter, these are pretty short, snappy videos. I hope they're snappy. Um, and then they can just access these anytime for a specific problems. This is that genetics to not a problem, and today's not a problem is probability. We're going to talk about the product rule, the sum rule, and how to use these in the context of monohybrid and multi-gene crosses. And then I just go through a two or three questions on a single topic. And, um, and they can watch those over and over again. Um, the problem with that is, of course, they take a while for me to generate, especially because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist, so I usually make them two or three times before I post them to YouTube. Um, so what I'm playing with right now is the idea of getting my students to generate them themselves. So if, if they do poorly on an exam, they could take a couple of the questions, they could post their own video, and if they describe the process in a very informative way, they could get extra credit for, for posting those videos, and then I could use those for future classes. So <laughs> everybody wins. Um, so, so that's it. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, post them to a poll everywhere, and I'd be happy to answer them later on. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Uh, we'll move really quickly into the next. We're going to go real person, video. Real person, video. I was going to say live person and then dead person, but I didn't think that was really very good. So this is a video by Amy Kachingwe about procedural learning in the e-lab and, and specifically in her physical therapy classes. So we have a doctorate in physical therapy program. It's a three-year doctorate program where the student is learning to be a physical therapist. So what I would do is I would have a binder. And so the binder would be very thick and it would show all the techniques. There's pictures, but that's basically it. So what I did with my iPad is I created an iBook. So whereas before, let's say they would have multiple binders of all their techniques, now it's in one source, 
and it allows them to have different mediums for to facilitate their learning. Using the iBook is very helpful because we have the video of our professor doing what she wants us to do. You can't get that out of a book, but in the iBook, it's right there for you. A lot of times the person that's acting as the patient will be holding the iPad, so they'll be on the table um, and someone will be working on them, reading step by step what the person's doing, and then the person who's acting as the therapist can also check it out as they're going along and make sure that they're doing everything in the right order, right hand placement and everything. It works really well because when they're in this small group, maybe they have a question that I'm on the other side of the room, I can't come in and answer them right away. So they can then go onto their iPad and watch the technique or read the description or look at the picture and it helps them figure it out in their group on their own without me having to come over and be there physically to show them how to do it. So over the summer I was working on my internship and I was very curious about how to do something. So I went and looked at my iPad and looked it up on the iBook and I was like, oh, perfect, that's what it is. Watch the video really fast and then started treating my patient from there. I think it's really helping the student learn the material quickly and synthesizing it quicker than we used to in the past. So they're coming more prepared. They have the source to do that now. So I think they're learning it a lot more thoroughly and comprehensively, I think, now with using the iPad. amazed at that uh, iBook that was made. It's, it's incredible and as a resource I suspect that that could be sold for quite a bit of money out on the real market but I don't think that's what Amy meant to do with it so uh, it's really helping her students out. Next we're going to have another live person. Okay, uh, Rachel are you alive? I am alive okay, so but Rachel, I'm not going to dance or sing. No singing? Oh, come on. So Rachel Friedman-Gnar from Special Education talking about flipping with an e-text. So flipping a classroom, meaning um, delivering part of the content through uh, something that the students interact with at home, and then delivering another part of the content in class face to face. And my motivation for doing this was really, first of all, there's not a lot published in the area that I was teaching this particular class in, which is spoken language techniques for teachers who are becoming teachers of the deaf, but working with a primarily um, a population of deaf students that uses American Sign Language as the language of instruction. So it's a pretty small um, niche content area for teachers. So I was motivated to write something they could actually understand. A lot of the stuff out there is very medically oriented. It comes from a perspective I don't share. So I wanted to develop something that came from the perspective of our program here at CSUN. Um, and I was motivated to deliver some of the content in a different format because I had to take a four hour class and teach it in three hours. So I had to figure out, okay, how am I gonna juggle all this content? content. Um, and it turned out that writing the e-text, um, which I used iBooks author for, and kind of conceptualizing the what, the content knowledge in terms of the iBook, um, worked really well and then in class during the three hours or two hours and change that I spent with my students it was more of that hands-on interactive um, process oriented I call it the how and why of what we are doing what we are doing um, so in developing my iText my iBook I have loved this process because I really like using technology and I like the interactive things. I've authored my iBook in the iBooks author. Um, so as I'm thinking about content, as I'm thinking about how I'm gonna present things to students, I'm actually thinking about how they're gonna interact with it. So I've used a lot of widgets that are both external to iBook through Bookery and also the internal iBooks widgets and I'll show you some of those. Um, and the widgets are, are various. They're images students can look at, they're videos they can watch, and then I also ask them to do something in response. So it's not just passive interaction. This is an example of some of the what the demographic information. And all of this used to be presented in class with the students listening to me kind of, not listening, but watching me kind of go through, <laughs> through, through the content in a very broad sense, I mean, right? Um, <laughs> go through the content. But now I'm able to present that content in the iBook 
and they can look at the content and kind of interact with it. This is a gallery widget that you can go through um, and look at the images as you're, as you're reading the text. So these are just examples of the what. And again, very visual um, presentation of the content so that they're getting an idea of what they're reading while they're reading it. In class, presenting the how and why, I did some, I, I'm doing some of the activities that I always do, and I always try to bring new things into class as well, but we used to always talk about, or we do talk about, what's the overlap between the job of a teacher of deaf students, a speech language pathologist, and an audiologist. So I was able to present reading content that they could get from the book and then come into class and we have this discussion and we build, or they build Venn diagrams and talk about overlap to see, you know, and really process through what, how what they do is similar to what these other professions do. Um, in class, we also talk about how to read an audiogram. That's a really important thing for a teacher of, a deaf, of the deaf. They need to know how to read an audiogram, explain it to parents, and I explain it in the iBook, but you know, explaining something and reading about it in an iBook is way different than being able to do it in class. So we have lots of hands-on time interacting with audiograms in class. And so, I mean, we do that anyway, but that's the how and the why of the content. Um, this is a, an example of one of the book read widgets. At the end of each section of reading, I have them reflect and give feedback that comes directly to me in an email um, so that they're actually having to kind of reflect back on what they've just read. The other kind of added benefit, I, I love how um, President Harrison said that we're perfecting our, our skills and things because, yeah, they're giving me feedback on typos. Like on page 46, you mistype, yeah, or this link doesn't work. So that's helpful to have that kind of proofreading as we go. Um, like I said, I've, I've done a couple videos um, and built those into the iBooks. And then I also have a feature I'm calling Mythbuster. I have students type in myths um, that they think, in this case in particular, about cochlear implants. There's a lot of um, myths out there and misinformation about what people think about children with cochlear implants. And so I have students type in, I get an email, I can look at what they're thinking about this content and then prepare content and be able to interact and discuss it in class. Um, so I'll be eager to hear what questions you have as we go through the rest of the presentations. Thank you. I hope you're all writing your questions down before you forget them because I'll forget. So hold on one second. Right. Make sure you hit the submit response. I had three questions for you, Rachel. So, all right, sorry. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, let's see. You were a real person. I think we're going to have a video, and that's going to be Matthew, Matthew D'Alessio and his students talking about social learning online. The course I teach is called Geology 107, Geology Goes Hollywood. We actually use the term for it, it's a born digital course. It's not something that we started off with as a face-to-face -face course. We said, we're gonna design a new course, we have this new media to present things in, what should we do that's actually gonna fit and really align well with that? One of the problems with online courses is that you've got all these people sitting out in their homes, all working alone on their computer doing this course. And that's not how we learn best. Uh, humans are wired to learn from each other. We are, we're sort of social learners. We needed a way to tap into that in this course. We needed a way to get people together to feel like they actually were a part of a community and really take their learning to the next level. So the very first day that they log in, they actually go to a slide and it has a list of their name and the names of all of their teammates. And that's how they started to meet each other and know that you're gonna be a part of this group the whole semester. So the group work in uh, Geology Goes Hollywood was interesting. And I say that noting the fact I was a little hesitant about it in the beginning. Like I was like, how is this gonna work in an online setting? But I think it worked really well. I actually talked to more people, uh, talked to more of my classmates in my online class than my regular class. Whereas the regular class, you just listen to the professor and what they're saying. You don't want to focus on, oh, what is, what is she doing or what is he doing? Students in this course got more A's than any of our face-to-face -face courses at the GE level uh, in our department. And we're really impressed by that. And part of the reason, we think, is because the students felt like they were 
more a part of a community in our class than they did even when they're actually sitting in a room with a whole bunch of other people. So by creating that sense of community, we actually got them more involved in the course and that helped them do better. Turns out they like to talk to one another, don't they? Yes. And they don't like us talking at them. So that's great. Uh, next up is going to be Anu Takur from Family and Community Consumer Sciences, excuse me, uh, talking about visual peer, virtual peer mentoring. I can't read either, sorry. There you go. Thank you. It's a long day. Hi. Um, I've been debating for a very long time how I was going to start this, and Matthew, right before this, gave me the perfect opener, and he looks at the paper and says, so you're going to talk about virtual peer mentoring in person? And I said, yes, so yes, I'm doing this live. Um, 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 I teach interior design in the Department of Family Consumer Sciences. And just a little bit background of something that we try to communicate to our students all the time about the profession of interior design. Um, design is 10% of your job, and the remaining 90% is communication. Um, you don't just pick that pretty paint color. You sell your client on that paint color. And you make sure the contractor buys the paint color you actually picked. And you make sure he puts it on the wall where he was meant to put it. And you make sure your client still likes it when it's up on the wall. There's a lot of communication, um, not just picking that paint color. And I have a lot of students who will come tell me, you just ruined it for me. I came here to pick that paint color. Um, <laughs> But that's a big part of it. Um, and the ability to accept constructive critique and provide constructive critique. Um, there's feedback at every stage of the process in the profession from your client. The contractor wants to give you their opinions at all times. And receiving that um, and being able to provide it. So in our classrooms, we will often ask students to give feedback about their classmates' work. And most of it is, you did such an awesome job. I love it. Mm -hmm. Critique, all right, very positive, but how constructive was that? Mm -hmm. um, so again, trying to teach them how to receive and provide that constructive critique. The problem here is the interaction. And we've seen over the years um, students moving to their respective devices on their respective drafting boards. Um, and not so much talking to each other, where the culture of design studios would be everyone huddled over a drawing and working together on it. And we have, I often have to ask students to get up from their tables and go look at everyone else's work across the classroom. The next 10 minutes are designated for it. So if that's what's happening in a classroom in person, how does that translate into an online classroom? There my problem gets amplified uh, multiple times. And I found a solution as an online class landed in my lab right after I completed the Redesign Institute this summer, the best two weeks <laughs> of my life. Um, <laughs> using those online communities to get students to talk to each other and build that community. Um, the class was the Interior Design Business Practices, as we call it, or Organization of Interior Design Practice. Um, and it started out, the very top, or the header started out with asking them to start meeting with each other and post your picture and your personal and professional goals, um, which every time they log in, it refreshes the image and they get to see each other's images, learn names. But most of all, I use the discussion forums um, on Moodle to help them learn to communicate and provide the feedback and learn to role play as professionals. And walk you through some examples of how the students did that. Um, I had them dialogue with each other. The one largest question that an interior design faces, interior designer faces from their clients, how much do I need to pay you? And why? Um, so I started out with everyone is a designer, putting them in designer and client pairs. Um, and they have this dialogue with each other online. You can see how how they really got into it is the client goes out, how much do I need to pay you on top of the project cost? And the designer responds. And the client say, why am I paying you for this? Why am I paying you for that? Why am I paying you the same amount for design as I am for drawing? And they go through this whole communication, which turned out to be some very interesting dialogues. Um, I also had them do a lot of role plays. So this was an assignment where they were supposed to dress up 
as they would for an interview with their ideal client or for a job at their ideal um, design firm. And I had um, a colleague who's an expert in Dress for Success share with me a, po um, a PowerPoint for the students to look through in terms of establishing their brand through dress. And here's what some of the students turned in, kind of catered to the whole selfie culture as well. I hear it's one of the top addictions today. Um, so they told us why they were dressing, why they picked the outfits they had. And most importantly, here's the feedback from their classmates. These are not, this is not my feedback. Um, it's their classmates saying, why don't you add a hint of color to your lips? You look so professional. You look approachable, but add a pendant. Again, just helping them. <laughs> The image. So th this was the starting out, and they had fun with it. And my colleague also provided feedback on um, to the student submissions, which was wonderful. Another role play assignment: um, an interior design in the designer in the field shared with me questions that she asks at interviews when someone interviews for a job with her. And I assigned each of these questions to the students. So each, each student had two questions. And they were supposed to videotape themselves responding to those questions. So this student um, is answering to, tell me about something you do in your life that demonstrates your ability to organize. I'm currently in my senior year of college, working two completely separate jobs, and have my own apartment to keep up. If I don't stay organized, everything will. It does for a little, it's about a minute and a half, each of those submissions, and then everyone watches those and they give feedback. Um, you don't want to let them know that you'll be leaving soon. It's good that you kept your hands where they were. Um, it's thoughtful that you uh, mentioned certain things. So again, very constructive feedback on how to respond in an interview. And here's an assignment that actually walks through the process of design. They're all developing their corporate identities and helping each other do so. Um, the students submitted their sketches, ideas, and by this time, they're posting questions for their classmates along with their assignments. So they'll submit their sketches and they say, I'm not quite sure which one I like, this is where I'm leaning. And then their classmates would respond with helping them pick one or develop one as they develop their corporate identity. This was a four-part assignment. Again, feedback at every stage. And now working with, again, the same ideas, um, I was afraid some of the assignments might be a little too complex, but they all took it in great stride, not a single question about how to do the YouTube thing. Um, and we're now working, again, with using that community building idea into other sites, um, especially our advisement site, because our program does advisement 100% behind the I'm very excited about that. strange, but it's an important thing to know. So the next we have a video of Jeannie Robertson and her students in biology, uh, active learning with tablets. I teach introductory biology, um, biology 106, which focuses on ecology, evolution, and biodiversity. I realized as I started to teach this class, and I started in the traditional way using PowerPoint lectures, that when I projected an image that contained pictures that look sort of like trees, so it's the evolutionary relationship depicted in a tree form, the students turned off. They were overwhelmed with the amount of information that I was throwing at them. The first time I taught with an iPad, I had this sort of moment of discovery where I realized that if we do it together, we can really break it down and it demystifies the process for them. And I find that if they build their own tree, they start to understand that tree. I'm Stevie. I am a peer learning facilitator. I took Dr. Robertson's class uh, last fall. I take the students down to the Botanica Garden and they bring their iPads so that they can take photos of the, the different plants that are examples of, of the things that they need to know. Using the iPad, though, opens up this experience to really engage the student in learning and understanding plants in a deeper dimension. I think it's very useful. Comparison, like, oh, drawing it out, that would take a lot of time while, like, you just, with an iPad, just take a picture of it. You have everything on, on, on the app, and you're going back and forth to, to the slides, uh, making notes on it, making uh, highlighting. It's much easier, like, you don't have to hold the book and, like, you know, do it. It's, it's amazing. 
this kind of active learning is rewarding for me as an instructor because it creates an enriched classroom for the students. I see that they are actively participating. They take pride in their work, showing me that they are excited and engaged in the course. And that's one of the things that is part of this learning process. As President Harrison said, we're, we're trying, and right? So it's little baby steps get us there at the end. So it's the turtle. We're all turtles, but we'll get there at the end. Uh, next, we're going to have Tom Spencer Walters from African Studies, Africana Studies, Multimedia Approaches to Language Instruction. And this is really cool stuff, so pay attention. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Um, it's always not very good when you're coming in at the end of presentations because all of the dazzling events and the dazzling uh, displays have gone on and you're already in tune to what you've seen. So I'll try not to bore you at all with my presentation. I will be working on multimedia approaches to language instruction. Uh, by the way, I'm a professor in the Africana Studies Department newly renamed department, and I teach most of the courses in literature and writing. And this is really one of my favorite courses, but one of my most challenges, challenging courses. Uh, the course itself is called AFIS 395, Bilingualism in the African American Community. This is uh, not an easy course to teach for several reasons which I have outlined here. One, because you're dealing with linguistics or language varieties, um, you have to be cognizant of the comprehensive nature of language structures, for example, cognitive systems of words, sounds, and meaning. Also, since a large part of the understanding of spoken language is fundamentally auditory, Listening skills are critical to developing appropriate pedagogy for AFRS 395. But probably the most challenging of all is the attitude towards language and dialects, which in my view reflects a very limited understanding of the function and utility of language. Uh, a lot of people talk about language that are standardized as if they're very different from dialects. For example, once we say standard English is the norm, is the standard, everything else is a dialect. And if it is a dialect, then it is substandard, it is not very good, and it reflects the social status of some of the people who speak those dialects. So these kinds of confusion that emanates out of the discussion of language and dialects really impinge upon the learning of the students who take classes like this one. So I thought there has to be a creative way you know, to reach students. And I started thinking of the e-text. And I was grateful that I had the opportunity to participate in this uh, um, initiative. One of the benefits that I found was the fact that textbooks were expensive, as many people have uh, you know, uh, attested to. The information from these books were scattered. I, I remember um, asking students to buy three or four texts, of which they will be using one or two chapters out of each one of those texts. Those three texts actually cost $250. And I felt this was wrong, that I should be asking them to spend so much money for a text that uh, they would use in a limited fashion. A lot of these print texts also didn't have multimedia functions at all. And student engagements, therefore, with these texts were limited and uninspiring. Some of these students will come after you've given them something to read, they'll come to class 
and you ask them about what you've asked them to read and they're looking at you as if they've seen you for the first time. <laughs> and they've paid so much money for these books. So I thought this was not really a, a good way to get in touch with our kids. So the e-text, creating the e-text itself was challenging for me because I wouldn't consider myself a, a technological guru, but I was very grateful for the help that I received, that I'm still receiving from uh, the technology, faculty technology people. They have been very, very good in that regard. I want you to take a look at my book uh, cover because it reflects some of the issues that I will be dealing with in the class. And those acronyms that you see there are acronyms that have been used to, you know, more or less define African American vernacular English. Um, Ebonics is probably one of the most contested of those, but you can see that the picture itself reflects people in conversation using African American vernacular English itself. The text will include um, videos, I have video examples, uh, some of which I have gotten from YouTube, others I was able to get from historical archives, and I just wanted to introduce quickly to you one of these because it's a very important part of what I expect students to understand about this course. Hello students, I am Dr. Spencer Walters, professor in the Department of Africana Studies. Welcome to AFRS 395, Bilingualism in the African American Community. Some of you may be puzzled by the association of bilingualism with the African American community, but as this course will demonstrate, the dialect spoken in African American communities meets many of the criteria traditionally associated with language, especially in the area of phonology, grammatical structures, morphology, and linguistic pragmatics. For example, African Americans have distinct speech communities where people grew up speaking a certain way that is perfectly intelligible to members of that community. I want the students to see this right away at the beginning because this is the focus of the course. I want them to begin to believe that what they're speaking is not substandard. It is only substandard because some people have called it uh, a dialect which does not meet the necessary representation of fashions of what we consider to be standard English. And in a sense, it is also building identity and self-confidence in our students to believe that language variety is not a curse in itself. So that's one of the things I would be using as well. And the text would also include what I would call audio clips. And these are like, for example, sounds and structures of African linguistic influences on African American English. I selected this example because it is very popular in the study of social linguistics itself, and it's easy to demonstrate. Um, I will be having students go out and actually role play the, the speeches, the various variations in, in speech patterns on the campus itself. We will be speaking in Ebonics and then translating into standard American English so they can actually see that these are all distinctive language varieties rather than one being you know, a dominant language over another. What I have here uh, is an example of the influences of African languages on Ebonics or African American English. And a lot, a lot of people don't realize that many of the structures and ideas and, and words that come into African American English actually came, originated from African languages brought over here by enslaved Africans uh, a couple of centuries ago. Uh, what we have here is a, a, a sentence which uh, 
I would like to show its variations in various uh, other African diaspora languages. That is, we always have fun. In African American English, it is we be jamming. Uh, in Sierra Leone Creole, is we the rumba. And in Jamaican Patois, is them the Irie, or them are Irie. And in Nigerian Pidgin, is we the shakara. If you look at all of them, there is a consistent linguistic basis of influence uh, for each one of these particular um, variation of language. Um, we will also be using images, diagrams, illustrations, and then uh, I will be linking to Moodle for discussion activities and assessments. I just want to quickly show you this particular cartoon uh, and, and read it very quickly. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, discrimination is a hellhound that gnaws at Negroes in every waking moment of their lives to rem remind them that the lie of their inferiority is accepted as truth in the society dominating them. And then the person says, now let me translate that into Ebonics for our African American students, which is really very classic. Something like, like this would be easy in the e-text to manipulate. You know, the, the, the manipulation of the image and students will be able to see um, really the ironies, the various levels of ironies that's involved here. Uh, I have also developed some questions that they will be working with uh, in exercises like those. Now, finally, um, moving forward, I am really confident that this e-text would make uh, this course more accessible to students. Obviously, it would save students money, as everybody else has pointed out, and also it would attract more students to the course because of its novelty, its interactive nature, and better in-class discussions. Um, it will also make students more likely to read and engage the text because it is so interactive in itself. Uh, finally, as I gain more experience doing this, I, I would really like to inspire and mentor other colleagues to create their own e-text. Finally, what I'd like to leave with you is the thought that if you validate someone's language, you're validating their identity and their culture. Thank you. The idea was when I, when I teach the documentary classes, I, I normally try to give some sort of a project. And I've had the idea of, of working on the issue of homelessness for quite a while. So we decided that we would break the students up into groups that would cover various aspects of urban poverty and homelessness. What we wanted to do was figure out a way to gather all the audio, the video, the textual information, the interview information, and find a way to, to sort of package it up and present it in a way that was attractive. And I think the iBooks format was ideal for that. Several of the students covered different organizations in the part of the, the solutions aspect of the story. And one of the organizations is called the San Fernando Valley Rescue Mission. And during the course of the semester, there was a major fire. So after we heard about all the devastation with the mission, we decided to have all the proceeds from our iBook that we would get go to their benefit and just reconstructing their mission for the people that we've been helping out and getting to know. Before I take this class, I never meet with homeless people in this country. If you want to help homeless people, the best way is to support them, not just the food, money, something. They need confidence. This was probably the most fulfilling class I've ever taken at CSUN. I was completely out of my comfort zone and was forced to do something that eventually was insanely rewarding for me. This was a completely different class, actually. It was like, for the first time, like, I wouldn't care at all about my grade. I just care about, like, sharing their stories, you know, like, I learned a lot, you know, it just it completely changed my life. You know, I think education it works better and it, it resonates better with the students when it seems relevant to their lives. So to try to create a, a, 
a project that has a practical application that has a real life component to it as opposed to just being strictly an academic exercise. So in that sense, I think it was very successful.
Yeah. Wait, we have an answer. Yes? What is the Faculty Technology Center? <laughs> I don't. Wow, what? That's autocorrect. Autocorrect. You want to do one more? We gotta. We gotta end on a winner. Let's do one more. Let's do another. Uh, let's do another season by the numbers. <laughs> Four hundred. Okay. Tablet courses taught by faculty have grown 188 percent in the last year. At this university. What co-winners with the people on the outsides. People on the outsides are always the winners. Uh, I'm just making stuff up as I go. All right, we're going to do a little review and questions. So I think we need all of the presenters to, are they coming up and standing? How are we doing this? They're all right here. Would you like to turn your chairs around? Or would you like to bring your chairs to the others? Why don't you stand up? No, okay, they don't. I was vetoed. We've got these microphones so we can run okay. them back and forth. If you press the button on it and hold it down, it'll be green button. We've got one on there, so we've got three okay. microphones. So we have Amy Chingwei, who, that was one of the videos that we saw about procedural learning in the e-lab. That's right. And Jeannie Robertson, who did the tablet. I actually paid an undergrad to do this. You can, of course, hire people to do it, but undergrads get, it's a nice way to support them uh, by giving them a little bit of money to do it. And they use uploading a video to YouTube, which has the automatic captioning, and then they clean it up and edit it, and it doesn't take them very long. And where do you get the money for that? That's the next obvious question, right? I have money. <laughs> <laughs> so there's the answer. Everybody go to Matthew. <laughs> Okay. I also work uh, pretty cheap on the side. So. Um, how do you compile your own e-textbook? Ooh, so how do you compile your own e-textbook? You come to the two-week session, or is it a one-week? How many? It's down to one week. It's down to one-week session in the summer. You actually apply for this. You say I want to do X, Y, and Z because I want to whatever with my class, and they will teach you all the tools you need to know. It's so. What did who said it? Rachel? No, yeah. Anu. The best two weeks of her life. Anu, really? <laughs> <laughs> Holy cow! Are you married? <laughs> <laughs> With two kids. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> two weeks. Wow. Okay, I'm not going to tell you about it. 
Okay, I was supposed to have read something. I'm, I'm messing this up. See this first. There were a great many questions about using tools for e-text in, in classes, and if I don't get to all the questions, don't hesitate to contact us at the Faculty Technology Center for help. Cheryl, here's a question for you. Have you obtained any evidence showing that students are actually reading free e-text? Well, no. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, so I, I pay them to find errors. I don't pay them a lot, but some students are, have already amassed quite a lot of money. Um, so I know that there's at least some students that are reading it. Um, and I think that even if they're not all reading it, it's got to be better than what it was before when I know that they didn't even buy a textbook. So I think we're at least moving in the right direction. I guess if I could, um, if it was some day in an iPad class, I would then embed things in there to make sure that they had to be going through there and then giving me little responses as I went along. So that's somewhere to go. I have a question for Sharon too. If you have 200 or 300 in your class, suppose you to not do that. Um, I wanted it to be something that my students only had. And my students have gone out in the clinic and they, they have clinical preceptors. And they've all said, oh my gosh, I want one of those. That is absolutely amazing. And I felt like, no, I wanted something that would make people want to come to Cal State Northridge. And this is something that I gave my students. And I'm having people now coming to our advising saying, I want to come here because I saw this amazing textbook that your faculty made. So, wow. so no, no money, just something for them. Yeah. You have tenure? I did. You're a full professor. You're not sucking up to anybody. Wow. <laughs> No, I'm not finding that at all. I mean, I there it, the reading it's um, it's very readable, and so they are reading it, and they are coming to class prepared. And um, I have those embedded kind of um, opportunities for them to go in there and reflect, and so I can kind of tell. And I'm not teaching 200 students, so I know if they're reading or not. What level class is this? It's graduate, post BA, teacher credential program. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so, getting back to, so graduate is very different than GE freshman. Yes, Cheryl, would you agree with that? Yeah. Uh, it is hard, and even in our biology majors class, we had this problem, you know, we give them flip lectures. And I'd look to see how many of them looked at it. Not all. They're losing, they're losing quiz points, but who cares? Matthew, what programs or methods were utilized in your course to create such a strong community atmosphere and collaboration? What software did you use? Uh, we use a service called VoiceThread. Uh, it allows people to make comments in video and voice and, uh, and, and plain old text. Uh, they can 
uh, basically, it's sort of like uh, sort of like lecture hall. You put up PowerPoint slides, and then I give comments with myself with video and, and talk about it. I can circle things, and, and then each student can pop in and have comments on that same slide. So it's sort of like an opportunity for them to ask questions right in class. And then I can give slides for each team to discuss things. And, and so they have this nice little interface where they're all, all their little pictures show up around in a circle as, as they're talking to each other uh, asynchronously online. And it worked pretty well. This is free. So, uh, it's, uh, VoiceThread is a free service that you can use. We paid for a CSUN integration with Moodle for our department. Um, so that came from Chancellor's Office funds. Good, that's great. Uh, let's see, Tom and others, how can you keep up with the YouTube video? What is this, video? They regularly seem to vanish from the web and your link is thus broken. I'm sorry, Tom, sorry. I'm losing it. That dark teaching thing is it's tiring. So, so how do you keep up with all the YouTube links that are broken? Um, what we're doing is uh, trying to put all of the YouTubes together in soft chalk. Um, this way, students can easily click on, you know, the, the icon and get into soft chalk and, and can actually get the video that they need to look at. So that's what we're doing. And I think the question that was asked earlier should answer that as well. You know, it, it gives you a chance to, to have all of your videos in one box and, and that way students have access to it as quickly as possible. Do, do, you, do you anticipate having to go back and check to make sure that they're all still available? And all, 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 yeah, all the time and, and functioning as well. Yes. Uh, because that's, that's an ongoing task, really. And how, how do you, Cheryl, how do you get around that? You just make your own videos. You make your own songs, you sing your own songs, <laughs> and you just do everything yourself. Yeah, that's totally yeah, efficient yeah. and easy. Yeah, efficient and easy, okay? So it's not efficient or easy, but it, it can be done. You can make a lot of, I suspect you're gonna make a lot of your own audio tapes so that different voices, different uh, sounds. Uh, let's see, anything else? David, are you David? I am David. Excellent, David, okay, I can do this. David, did you only have one topic that the entire class worked on? And if so, or if not, it doesn't really matter, will you change topics each semester? Great assignment. Yeah, so right thanks. Um, yeah, we did have the, the one topic was homelessness and basically issues related to homelessness. We, we thought we were gonna go into urban poverty and all the symptoms of homelessness, but we found that just homelessness enough was enough to keep us really busy. In fact, it's almost surprising that we were able to finish an entire book in one semester. And I think that I, would really like you guys to give a recognition to my three students that came in today. <laughs> Lucas and Mama and Haley because I, could, I presented them with a, with a pretty daunting task to go out and, and get out of their comfort zone and go out in the streets and the alleys and the homeless shelters. And they had to embrace it and they did. And they had, not only did they have to um, do the journalistic work that we would have normally done, but they had to do it while learning new technologies. So it was a fantastic experience for all of us. Question, Jeannie, do the students need much training on using a tablet at the beginning of class? Right? Can they just walk in and use this, this device? Yes, surprisingly, they need a lot of help in the beginning. You would think that they would be experts at this point, but they're not. And they are really good at Candy Crush and whatever they do. But um, I, on the very first day of class, in the first three minutes, I have them upload images to Moodle, learn how to take a screenshot, annotate that screenshot by basically, I borrowed this from Mary Pat, but they take a selfie and then they write their name on the selfie and then they upload it to Moodle. And if you do that in the very in the first two minutes of class, then they get the idea that this is going to be a regular thing and that they need to catch up. The first time takes about 15 minutes and the second time 10 minutes and the third time a minute. And we do three or four of those a day. And so they catch on quickly. They, they, they learn, learn quickly. They're, they're, they're better at learning than we are. My aunt, okay. I think we need to have the patience to get through that discomfort zone when they are, you know, we're, we want it to happen really quickly, and if, we don't, if it doesn't happen quickly, we shut down and we say, okay, forget it, but stay with it. We'll get there. Cheers, I don't want that. Harry or Elizabeth? I think that taps you, Elizabeth, sorry. <laughs> How to, how to get credit for our e-work for the tenure and promotion process. Oh, that's so not me. 
<laughs> Where's Bill Whiting? Yeah, I don't, that's really a hairy question. So um, I will ask him and uh, get it to people. But he, he is looking at um, how to get a process going for peer review so that um, it can count toward publication for RTP. Um, and I know that there have been some conversations in PPNR um, about that so that it's not just uh, work uh, for your teaching but also for, uh, for your um, publication credit. But it's not me. I'm, I don't do faculty. I do students. <laughs> um, let me just, did you just say, just think about what you just said. <laughs> yeah, no, you're right. Sorry. It's, it's so typically something that would have come out of my mouth. So, um, I think, I, I know. Everybody who doesn't know me, I, that's who I am. You do know me, so. Okay, I think we're gonna call it quits there. And does anybody have any further burning questions? We, we, Oh, money. I'll take money. <laughs> and Adelaide has money for me. Uh, up to you, Dion. So, no, I get to provide the closing comments, and while they're loading, you know, this is our third year of doing these annual showcases, and I have to say, just sitting back there, I feel like a kid in the candy store, because if you just look, I mean, are our faculty amazing or what? So let's give them another round of applause. Thank each and every one of them. This is the day when we really get to see their innovation bursting forth. So it's just a wonderful day. So let's jump into uh, where to from here. So we have really reconceptualized what we're doing over the last year or so into this larger term called e-learning because we began to notice that everything was converging. So whether you're making an e-text, and by the way, these are all up online now. There's about 40 or 50 with new ones coming in daily, so you can go check them out on the web. Or whether you were redesigning your course, or whether you were teaching a tablet class, they all started to require the same blend of sound pedagogy and helpful technology. So we finally realized we're just going to put them all together, call them e-learning, because we have a joke in the FTC, you know, are you talking about a book and a course or a course and a book? So they're starting to be interchangeable, which is really fascinating. So hopefully, oh, also, we don't know. I mean, next year's showcase, who knows what our faculty are going to be doing, because technology is such a moving target that there's constantly new innovations that faculty are coming up with. So hopefully you're thinking, how can I get started? Well, we want to help you get started. So you can now apply for what we're calling an e-learning grant. So everything has come together. There's one application form, one application process. So you can create an application to do an e-text or some kind of digital content, to uh, redesign into a hybrid online or flipped or technology enhanced course. You can create a proposal to redesign your course for tablet pedagogy. And there's even a category where if you're an expert and you've gone through the Course Redesign Institute and you now want to help your peers, you can apply for a grant to do that. So you can go to, where's my shiny apply now? There it is. And the website is www.csun.edu slash IT slash e-learning. So you will find everything there. Now, what's involved in one of these e-learning grants? Well, you get a stipend of some sort, which you can use for reassigned time or uh, special pay. You will then go through a one-week institute. So we have three of these scheduled over the summer. So as we've been mentioning, we boiled it down from two weeks to one week. Because we realized that all these initiatives, they all require audio. They all require images. They all require video. They all require making your content accessible. There's so many common denominators that why not just cover them all in one go? So there's the One Week Institute, and you do need to do some kind of prospectus. You know, share your idea with us. Let us know what you're thinking. And of course, there's a deliverable at the end, but we will help you get there. That's our job. And finally, we ask that you somehow share your experiences, whether it's at a, a forum like this, or a reflection, or participating in a faculty learning community. We want to learn from you because you are the pioneers going through the process 
and you are the experts when you come out of that process. So we'd love to share your experiences with uh, all of our faculty. Okay, and finally, I want to say some very well-deserved thank yous. This has been a lot of preparation. We've had an amazing team to put this together. So I'd like to thank everyone from President Harrison's support, did I get that right? Um, to Academic Affairs, to our generous provost, to Hillary Baker in uh, Information Technology. So this is a word cloud, and in case I miss anybody, they're all here, but the major groups are up here. Faculty development has been absolutely amazing. The Oviat Library, uh, the Dream Team at the Faculty Technology Center. Let's give a round of applause. <laughs> advancement, uh, all of our amazing presenters who are lined up here, you've heard from each and every one of them. So it's been a really co wonderful, cohesive effort to put this together, and we can't thank everyone enough. And with that, I think we are done. So feel free to get up and mingle and grab some snacks and come ask anybody any questions. Thank you all very much for coming today.